greetings. Thanks for joining me. It's Fred in Alaska. Uh, apologize for being in the Tahoe. We got a lot of snow. Uh, I mean, a lot. I'm looking at about 15 inches or so just on top of the four-wheeler and not counting the other stuff that... Anyway, it's just a winter mess and it's hard to get around. So uh, here in the near future, I'll, I'll get out on a snow machine or something and, and get you guys some nice footage. <laughs> uh, coming up Friday the 22nd, uh, December 22nd. Again, it'll be at 7 p.m. I'm going to be back on uh, Night Dreams Talk Radio. Dot com. There'll be a link in the description. Uh, by now you've seen the flyer, or I'll, I'll post it now. Um, so they're having me back. I guess there's something like 4 million downloads or something on that appearance or whatever. So I'm going to go back this coming Friday. And uh, thanks again to James for reaching out. Uh, that being said, what I wanted to share with you uh, comes from Brad. Brad was a former fishing guy. Uh, he worked on the Nushigak River, he worked up the Wood River, up at Leknagik. He, he's been all around my old stopping grounds, right? And he reached out last summer initially, and it took a while um, because of his work schedule and stuff. He no longer lives in the state, just, you know, out of happenstance, not, not particularly because of this incident. But so <clears throat> anyway, it took a while is, is what it was. And I finally was able to pinpoint the area uh, sent him some some photos from Google Earth and he guided me into the area a little bit of back and forth to get the the sequence of events down so uh, on his off time he went with a buddy he met from a different outfit they met at the CN bar in Dillingham the season before they were buddies and they decided this when they both had time off they were gonna go up to McClung River and you know fish for grayling or whatever and just get up in there head towards uh mcclung hills and and basically just see alaska you know what i mean because they were so client oriented they're you know rigging up people's poles most of the time running up and down river chasing king sam and that kind of stuff so they they were going to enjoy some time just to do the fishing they wanted to do which was fly fishing and so they get up past tidewater well above tidewater uh, closer to McClung Hills, it, you'll see it. I'll show the map here uh, of the approximate area. And so, uh, when they get there, uh, they had to walk around. So, meaning there's a smaller little tributary creek that that fed into the McClung where they had stopped and they hiked because the boat wasn't going to get in there and it was too many big rocks and things of this nature too shallow water they had to use a jet unit there's just getting to this spot there was some deadfall in the water there was a, a beaver dam that was trying to be built so they they had to fight to get back up in here right and they had started earlier in the day and this is uh end of july right so i mean still plenty of daylight for a long time so they they took a while to get up in here and um they parked the skiff and they started hiking. Now, they were both armed and they had their fly fishing gear and a small little day pack with something to eat in it, right? So they packed their gear and they walk around and it's it's an elf shape, like an ear, an elf ear shaped kind of bend that they get around and they get to the sandbar. And so I'll integrate the map here of what was going on because as they were approaching this little gravel bar that they were gonna fish off of uh, they you got to understand this creek has pretty high banks on the sides uh, not like a sheer drop nothing overly major but you know in some places up to seven foot or whatever right and you, you should be able to see th some of that detail in the map so where the number one mark is in the yellow is the first weird noise they heard they, they heard it off at the distance kind of looked at each other as they were walking and was like well, well what, I don't know well I guess we'll see if it comes in or whatever they get a little further to marker number two and that's where they hear weird noises they could not they said it sounded like someone just making up a language real loud blah, 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 just gibberish real real loud and they're like what the hell maybe there's some locals drunk back up in here or something 
you know, we're, we're fishing, but no big deal. You know, everyone's been friendly, so nothing to really worry about, right? They get down to where they're gonna start fly fishing, right? And they're a couple casts, you know, they're whipping the line back and forth. And from what Brad said, uh, his buddy Liam was down below him and he was a little bit further up on the bank, uh, higher up. And, you know, again, it's about three, four foot difference. So Brad sees something off to his left and he turns and that will be the first sighting. It'll be marked on the map. He sees this thing, it's a dark figure, and it starts moving from his left around in, in the trees, coming around towards where, which would be directly across from where Liam was down below. And he gets Liam's attention and says, hey, there's something big and dark moving in the trees over there, you know? And, you know, Liam's like, oh, it's probably just a bear. You know, he, he stops what he's doing, he, he re-spools his line, and he backs up, and he's, uh, getting over because he had taken off his shoulder holster where he had a 44 Magnum and set it down on his day pack because it was messing with him as he was trying to fly fish. He was rubbing under his arm and it was irritating him so he had taken it off but he immediately puts it back on and this thing circled in front of, into in front of them as they were both standing there and it screams at him, right? And immediately uh, they were like, what the hell? Because they could make out a silhouette of something large, man-like and it, it was just pitch black in, in their field of view. Um, the sun was kind of in their eyes at that moment, so they, it was just dark. They, they couldn't make anything out. It was just dark, and the way it was right by the trees, it, it, it was just a dark silhouette. That scream happened. They, Brad said that it felt like, um, it almost made him cough from jiggling his lungs. Like, it, it was with so much force. It, it, kind of made him kind of gasp with his breath a little bit because of the intensity of it and he said it was like the, one of the loudest things he has heard uh, outside of being right next to a runway when a jet takes off right so that that's some high decibels right there so they're they're startled they're like what the hell so they clamor their stuff real quick and you gotta understand it took them time it took them an hour and a half two hours to get through this brush following game trails and all that just to get to where they were now they start retreating right very uh, uh, reserved they weren't running they didn't want to run they didn't know what this thing was but it was loud and it was big and neither one of them had bigfoot hairy man on their mind right now once they start backing up they get about maybe 60 yards into their retreat and this thing is opposite of them off to their left as they're facing this creek right because they kept hearing noises in the brush and they're you know Liam's like it's following us it's over there it's following us so they both stop and look and sure enough it comes out a little bit and that's when Liam gets pegged with the, just the smallest little pebble just boom, hit him center of the chest startled the shit out of him uh, he drew his pistol and points it at it and it goes back into the trees right and then more rocks start raining in just landing around the little, little ones not, nothing too big immediately they're both freaking out uh brad says come on let's go let's go they get they get to moving again they didn't get a whole lot much further just around to the, the apex of that real tight bend there at what what i call the top of the elf here right about there and more rocks start raining in. And, and they were trying to pinpoint where the rocks coming from because at this point, the rocks were coming in real hard and real fast, uh, hitting backpacks, uh, hit uh, Brad in the leg. Uh, he said that it hit his leg so hard he still has a, a hardened nodule under his skin just from the impact of it. It was, uh, he still got a knot in the muscle from, from where this thing had impacted. And so immediately, uh, it was go time as far as they were concerned. They wanted to shoot this thing, right? Uh, he said it wasn't his brightest idea because he had a 357, Liam had that 44. That's what they had for bear protection, right? And they they deliberated, well, let's not, maybe we shouldn't shoot. Maybe we shouldn't shoot. So Liam says, I'm going to pop one shot and see what this thing does, right? Because they could see it directly across from them basically on this little pinnacle 
and they see it just kind of swaying, kind of looking. Uh, it was staying behind a group of three small trees, just barely showing itself every once in a while. So Liam pops a shot that direction, just over the top. Immediately it disappears. They're like, okay, great. They continue on. Uh, they're motivated, so they're moving fairly quickly. <laughs> they get back around to where they had parked the skiff, which is the blue dot. Now, when they get back over to the skiff, they, they were not, they weren't uh, cheery at all. They, they had started bickering amongst each other um, they, under stress. They, they were both under stress and they started nitpicking each other about who was gonna drive this, that, and the third. You know, it was, it was just due to the tension. It wasn't nothing, uh, I'm sorry, I had that blaring so loud. Uh, it was just due to strictly the tension in the air um, that they were just this micro bickering over nonsense, right? So Brad catches it and says, hey, hey, we're, we're, we're lashing out at each other, man. The, we'll, you can drive, that's fine, whatever, right? So they get to the skiff. Now, understand, on their retreat throughout the whole time, they are hearing this thing off across the creek, breaking stuff, thrashing, making all sorts of weird noises. Uh, he said none of them he could attribute to an imitation of a sound or anything. It all sounded like gibberish and yelling, right? Uh, intermittently, there'd be like a real high-pitched whistle that, that hurt the ear. It was so high-pitched and strong. And, and that was all random in nature as they were retreating after Liam fired the shot over this thing's head, right? So from what Brad said, when they got to the skiff... Uh, it looked like it had been messed with. Uh, there was some impressions in the gravel, uh, but they couldn't tell from what. They assumed it was from this thing or uh, another one, so immediately uh, super high tension. Um, now, it wasn't like tipped over or anything like that, but it had been kind of quasi pulled up further up onto the beach, and they were just dumbfounded by it because they, they had an anchor line tied off, and just barely pulled up because it wasn't real fast moving at that point as far as the river there wasn't a heavy current that was just going to whisk it away and so it, seeing it pulled up like that they're a bit stressed so they work together meanwhile keep in mind the whole time there's thrashing and yelling going off off in the distance right so they they get it pushed back down and liam hops in and he's firing it up and that's when a rock hits the skiff so Brad was trying to figure out where it was coming from because they, they were kind of raining down at an arc very similar to what happened to uh, Daniel and Christopher as far as it was coming in like artillery and just landed in the skiff blang 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 and these were a little bit bigger rocks than the ones before the ones before were you know anywhere from the size of a cashew to the size of a walnut he said the one that hit him in the leg real hard was about the size of a walnut and these were river rocks they were smooth and uh <laughs> so immediately he's like you know what the hell so he he's following looking back he has to go around because if you notice in the map there's a little bit of a lip at the mouth of that creek and he had to kind of get up on the rise a little bit to see past beyond where the rocks were coming from i have that labeled in the map as well but um he sees it it's standing and it, it has no qualms about him seeing it at all it's just looking right at him and just chucking these rocks so he's like well screw this noise you know he yells hey 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 real loud has his gun in his hand this thing is just unfazed unfazed like brad wasn't doing anything he hears the outboard running <clears throat> liam's warming it up just a little bit and uh as as he gets back down to push off another rock hits plang 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 and so he's like, what the hell? Because the rock that landed that time came from off to his right-hand side. So he's facing the river, pushing the skiff off, and the rock comes in this way, right? And they, that's the direction they're going to get back down to the Wood River. And so immediately his attention is drawn to his right, justifiably so, especially with the rock coming in like that. He said that when he turned and looked and, and looked down a ways, there was a dark head above the brush that was at least seven foot tall as far as what he was guesstimating. And there was a head above it and he would see the hand 
the the second time I threw something, he saw the hand come up over the brush and watch the rock come and land right in front of his feet. He said at that point he freaked out. Uh, another rock rained from where the one that was back behind them hit hit inside the skiff, and he pushed off, got in, pulled out his 357, and was pointing at this thing as they were getting up to speed up on the step as as they were going by he he's just basically following it with his 357 and it just he said it turned and watched them he said he got a really good look at the one that was right there off the edge of the river uh he said it looked real neanderthal like like a uh, very caveman like uh had uh grayish skin uh he couldn't tell if it was super wrinkly but he could see some dark crease wrinkles nose flat to the face real broad jaw real broad he said what was weird though is it looked like it was balding like it had a bald spot uh he said it wasn't like a, a really crested or anything like that he said it was rounded but bald and, and he said it was the, the strangest thing you know he 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 didn't expect you know a, a sasquatch to be bald or whatever which is it i i have no clue I, i'm no expert here and it just stayed still it stopped throwing rocks as he was pointing and they they skiffed by now they get back down uh to the wood river and they they get brad back to the outfit he was working at and liam had to take his skiff and go back to his outfit or whatever they they just call it quits the, you know their adventuring was done brad talks to his boss and he's like I need to let you know what we saw up the McClung River. They start throwing rocks, this, that. He tells them everything, right? And his boss is like, bullshit. He's like, you know, no, this is what happened. He goes, look, you're under contract. You, you know, you got your six pack license. You got this, you got that. I, I need you to operate the skiff that you're here for. You're, it sounds like you're trying to back out of the contract. And he goes, no, not at all. I'm informing you of what we saw over there. And the guy's like, bullshit, show me then. And very reluctantly, Brad agreed. He takes his boss at the time back on up there the next day. They go back to the exact same spot, and there's tracks. Uh, there's a lot of gravel, but there was a couple muddy parts where you could clearly see a very large bear footprint. Not a bear like, Arr, but a bear human foot shaped print, clearly in the mud. Uh, he said they were at least almost 20 inches long, which is a, a big ass foot I mean big so his boss walks over and is just real arrogant and just like because Brad never in, intended on quitting his job you know what I mean he it, it wasn't in him he was like no this is I'm just informing you kind of how he's coming out but the way his his boss acted was very arrogant very dismissive um just went over and stomped on it. he goes that's just a double bear track man you don't know you, you know you're not going to learn anything by you know being scared of bears out here and this and that and brad's like look I've, I've been doing this for different outfits over the years i'm not unfamiliar with bears i know what a bear is and i know what we saw wasn't a bear and essentially he ends up losing his job because of the arrogance of his boss was like i'm not going to have you you know potentially tainting clients with this nonsense and all this that right and and brad was just informing him he had no intention of sharing it you know what i mean because he, he didn't want to feel like a crazy person or whatever so essentially the guy ends up firing him i, I don't mean to laugh but you know like he fired him on the spot like and said once once we get back to the lodge you gather up your stuff I'm, I'm taking you to dillingham and you're gonna get yourself a flight out of here because and you owe me for the flight here because you didn't complete your contract right and at that point brad was like you know up yours dude yeah get go ahead and get me out of here you know so the guy ends up taking him back to dillingham the next day because there was some stuff going on at the lodge or whatever but uh so when he gets back to Dillingham, uh, he happened to run into Liam, who was at AC uh, Alaska Commercial Market, uh, picking up some su supplies or whatever, right? Tells him, hey, dude, I, I lost my job or whatever. And it so happened that they needed another guy. So in instead of bailing out like he had thought he was going to have to, his buddy Liam, who was with him, got him lined up with the outfit he was working for. And he finished the season that way. Uh, he said he never repaid the guy for the ticket, told him to get bent. But uh, I want to thank them for reaching out. 
Um, I did not get a chance to speak to Liam. Uh, it's it's been a while since Brad has had contact with them. This experience happened to them about 15 years ago. Um, I want to thank them though. I want to thank you, Brad, uh, for sharing that. Um, it, it took a while to get the mapping right, but you know, this area of the McClung, just north of Dillingham, up the Wood River, just in the, the mouth of the McClung is in a tidal zone. But once you get past that, it's all fresh water going back towards McClung Hills, right? Which would be northeast, north northeast roughly you'll you'll see in the map it kind of squiggles up to the northeast and i mean it's rugged remote very large bears very big bears going through there um yeah and that's where the elderly couple saw the bushmen as they call it that that jumped across into the water and uh john who shared his experiences with us from fairbanks on down uh he pointed out that they were freaked out he saw the wet tracks you know on the gravel or whatever leading away or whatever but man you know just just be aware out there because it's not they're not behind every tree uh, however it's very random in nature and you just never know like there's been plenty of people oh, I've been hunting the same spot 40 years and then one little 20 minute experience and they don't even hunt anymore you know so and for those seeking this kind of encounter uh, good luck you, you gotta be careful what you wish for because you just may get it um again night dreams talk radio coming up on friday and the link will be in the description and again thank you brad for sharing and for everyone joining me and we will catch you guys soon